and for preparing to live stream. This is really exciting. And for preparing to live stream. This is really exciting. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and my name is Leanne Lam, and I'm the Executive Director of Contemporary Asian Theater Scene, otherwise known as CATS. And we'd like to welcome you to the conversation with playwright and actress Jeannie Sakata. This is a very exciting program, and we're thrilled to have her because we've seen her on stage, on screen, on television, um, um, everywhere. <laughs> And then we have a chance to talk to her and learn more about not only her, her, her journey, but also her plays, uh, Hold These Truths, and why uh, a little bit more about her success. I'd like to also thank and uh, thank my uh, co-moderator for today, Reiko Iwanaga. And Reiko is on the board of Contemporary Asian Theater Scene and also quite a dancer. I think she's created the Obon dance um, and has, has tried quite a legacy with her family in, in history of, of that. Also, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about CATS because CATS is um, pro pro uh, promoting this program and we really are coming together to support our Asian American artists and their work. We're trying to share the Asian American experiences and hope bring more solidarity into new communities. So we have a lot more love and joy in our lives. I think we can all appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to bring in Reiko Iwanaga and Jeannie Sakata. Hey! hey. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you for having us. Yes. Welcome, Jeannie. <laughs> this is fabulous. Jeannie, this is, your, your, your work speaks for itself. And I think many people have seen Hold these truths. It's such an important play about about the life and times of, of Gordon Hirabayashi. Mm -hmm. um, but as we begin, can you start us off? And for those who haven't seen the play, um, can you actually sort of explain a little bit about what it's about? Well, it's about um, Gordon Hirabayashi, as you said, who was during World War II in the 1940s, a college student at the University of Washington in Seattle. And after Pearl Harbor was bombed and government orders followed for all people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast uh, to be forcibly removed from their homes and eventually put into barbed wire prison camps across the United States, Gordon, as an American citizen, said this is wrong. Um, the Constitution guarantees me and everyone constitutional rights, and we should not be in prison without due process. And so he bravely defied these orders and turned himself into the FBI with a statement as to why he was disobeying the orders. And then a legal team coalesced around Gordon. They were able to challenge these orders and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court where he was unanimously ruled against in a really devastating defeat. But decades later, evidence surfaced that showed that military necessity argument that was used at the Supreme Court was totally based on lies. And they were able, uh, a, a, a team of attorneys, uh, many Japanese American attorneys uh, were able to take Gordon's case back into the courts along with Min Yasui's and Fred Korematsu, two fellow resistors of Gordon's, and um, vacate, get their criminal convictions vacated after decades. So hold these truths, I would say about 80% of the play is a flashback into when Gordon is a young college student. It even goes into a little bit of his childhood and teen years before he gets to the University of Washington. And um, it was just really a labor of love because I fell in love with the story when I first heard of it and started to research it. I was just so fascinated and I became obsessed with it really. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else. And I almost, I tell people I almost didn't have a choice. It was like I had to write it. So, um, and, well, and, and thank you to, you know, the, it means a lot to me that the play has come to the Bay Area since I'm a Watsonville native. And uh, since uh, 
South Bay, the San Francisco area, Palo Alto, you know, I know these areas well, being from Watsonville, and um, it's been very, very special to take the play there. Well, I think I was going to ask about what inspired you, but you've answered that, but we're going to come back to that. When you said Watsonville, I, I, I have to say that a very good friend of mine and a very well-known activist, Mas Hashimoto, yeah. Was your teacher? <laughs> and well, he I actually didn't have Moss as a teacher, but I oh, knew him. But he did say that you he nominated you for the Watsonville High School um, Hall of Fame. Yes, he oh, did. Yay! <laughs> that's what another honor. I know that's so sweet. I'm so <laughs> grateful. Among many other that. honors that went. And, and Moss <laughs> actually brought uh, my Los Angeles Gordon here to actually name Ryan Yu. He brought Ryan up to do a staged reading of the play. And we yes. did it, I believe, at the Salinas Community Center. I can't remember the he, name. He said they put it all on free of charge for everyone to yes. Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. Yes. And that was a very special occasion. So so how did those early years get you to where you are today as far as deciding to become an actress? And <laughs> well, you know, I grew up. Actually, in Monterey County, you know where the Pajaro River is, you go over the bridge. And so we were on the other side. And um, my grandfather and uncles and my dad farmed iceberg lettuce. And they were cicada oh. ranches, you know, in Watsonville. And so we lived um, up until I was in the third grade, right by the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks. <laughs> And um, just right in the middle of the iceberg lettuce fields, you know, right by the JJ Crosetti processing plant. And um, I'd have to walk down a dirt road through the lettuce fields to get to school, you know, Pajaro school. And um, so I had very vivid memories of those years. And I think there's a link to wanting to write about Gordon because I really understood what it was like to grow up in a rural environment. Oh, and Gordon was talking about, he said, yeah, I think my parents, they grew iceberg lettuce too. They grew cauliflower and peas. And, you know, he would just describe working in the farm and working in the fields. And I felt this in a very visceral way, the, the sights and smells and sounds. And, you know, I felt like I could write from a place of authenticity um, about Gordon's childhood on the farm. <laughs> um, of course, there were many differences as well, but you know, I, I knew what it was like to hoe lettuce and to you know, be out in the sun and you know, worry about, or watch my parents worry about um, you know, farm conditions and whether the crop was gonna turn out and lettuce prices. And I, I knew all that. East of Eden, right. Yes. Wow, yes. impressive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so being and, 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 and two Gordon was from a it was actually a Quaker Christian family, but um, my grandfather and my dad and were very uh, active at Westview Presbyterian Church. And so I knew what it was like, you know, when Gordon said, oh, I grew up with this hymn or I grew up, you know, I remember reading this passage in the Bible. I said, oh, I know that. I know what that's like. I, I know what it's like hearing the Lord's Prayer in Japanese, you know? <laughs> right. So I felt, I felt like those details really helped me be in Gordon's story, you know? Um, right. it, it's nice to know that you know the sights and smells and sounds of something. It, it gives you a kind of way to land in the story. Okay. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That is so interesting. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 Watsonville and, and, and um, Santa Cruz County was a whole different place at, at the time. It was a beautiful place to grow up, I would imagine. Yeah. But, you know, it was, all, I also related to another aspect of growing up in a rural environment. And that was, you know, Gordon was really restless and, you know, he, he wanted like to get to the city <laughs> and, and he went, well, he was such a, he was such an adventurer, you know, he ended up being a sociologist and studying um, uh, the a native Indian uh, tribe that was in Canada, I think it was called the Dukabor tribe. But then he ended up after the war going to the Middle East to teach in Lebanon and Egypt. Mm -hmm. And he was, he had such international interest that what he did in Hold These Truths, just one small fraction of his life, you know, he had an amazing life. And similarly, I, you know, had dreams of 
traveling the world. And at the time, I thought he'd become a, a journalist, you know, <laughs> travel the world and um, write about the world and report um, on things happening around the world. And so I was really eager to like, you know, get out of the lettuce fields. <laughs> and, and so every time we went to San Francisco, it was like, yay, we're going to San Francisco, we're going to Candlestick Park, or we're going to the Ice Follies. Or <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're going to <Coit> Tower, <laughs> the zoo, the aquarium. <laughs> and that led you to acting? <laughs> yes. You know, actually, my first exposure to the performing arts was um, uh, in San Francisco, it was the Ice Follies. I forget where, oh, <laughs> where it was, oh, but that was a revelation to me. I said, you mean people can make a living skating around an ice rink pretending to be cartoon characters and people clap for them and they dance and wear costumes. And it was kind of a revelation <laughs> to me that I never forgot, you know? And then years later, you know how, you remember the Circle Star Theater? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, so my I remember oh, my yes. mom. My mom got all dressed up one night to go see Mitzi Gaynor at the Circle okay. Star, and that was such a huge thing, you know. Right? And um, we go to the Circle Star, and you know, I I, I saw um, this. I'm just babbling on here, so no, just no, stop me. When it's so interesting. It's great. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I had my teenage crushes, and yeah. one of them was this um, British duo named Chad and Jeremy. And do you remember Chad and Jeremy? summer song and yeah and so um so I would I, there was a, a concert that they gave at Circle Star Theater and you know I, I went and I was you know waiting for their autograph after the show and so you know going to San Jose or to, to Oakland or to San Francisco always meant like these cultural experiences right, true. <laughs> that that were so exciting to I think kind of pre-shadowed my interest in the performing arts, yeah. Oh, well, that is it, it does have to start somewhere. Definitely. That's right. <laughs> Chad and Jeremy at the circle. <laughs> I think but I think bring, bring, bring I think, it, bring it I think in actually the first. Theater. Yes, but I think actually the first, maybe the first uh, dream I had of being a performer was actually in Watson because my my mom took me to the Fox Theater. Was it the Fox or the? Was there a theater called the Center Theater Central? Anyway, she took me to see The King and I. Okay. And, you know, okay. seeing all those Asian kids singing and dancing, oh, I just totally okay. did it, you know. And then I was taking ballet lessons in Watsonville and my ballet teacher, uh, Miss Cooley, I remember her name was Miss Cooley, and she was from England and she was doing, she was gonna play Anna in a production in Salinas. And she wanted to be one of the Siamese kids. And I begged my mom, to let me do it, but it was too much. She would have to drive me to Selena's for rehearsals and it was just too much time. But I said, oh, I lost my chance. <laughs> so, so you I was so mad at my mom for <laughs> months. Um, that is so interesting. What, what was your next chance that really did take you on your way? <laughs> oh, well, gosh, um, then many, many, many years passed. <laughs> And I think what did it was when I was in college, um, I was asked to take part in a, in a skit um, for, it was a, a church group. And I kind of that feeling came back was, oh, I love this. I love mm -hmm. pretending I'm someone else. And I took an acting class at UCLA uh, just for fun, but I felt so at home, mm -hmm. you know, up there in front of everyone doing a monologue or a scene. And I, I thought, wow, I, I can't forget this feeling. And then a friend of mine who sang at my wedding, Melinda Fong, uh, she um, was a musical theater major. And she was in a production of Godspell at UCLA. And when I saw her up on stage, I literally had this like out of body experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just felt like I have to do what Melinda's doing. I have to be up there. And I didn't know how to get it, but I felt like I actually left my body and went up on the stage with it. So then I started, you know, taking, um, I took my first acting class at UCLA and puppetry and, you know, this is a very long answer to your question. <laughs> no, it's very exciting. It's, it's always interesting to hear people's journey because I think yes. we all, 
when we, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't see Asians on screen. We no, saw we them. didn't. We saw the King and I. Um, we might have seen maybe someone in the ballet, but it was few and far between. So yeah. setting your own course, setting your journey was very, very important. Yes. Oh, should I just get that phone so it's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure, go ahead. Leanne can plug the move play at the same oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, I wanted to let everyone know that if you want to see Honor uh, Hold Our Truths is actually playing at the San Francisco Playhouse. There's three more performances. I believe it's going to be Thursday, to, tonight, Friday, and Saturday. And then, uh, so if you can actually see it, you can see it not only in theater, but it is on live stream. So go to FSF Playhouse and order your tickets so you can actually see it in, in whatever is comfortable. But we are, um, but Jeannie also said that the Playhouse is spatially distance, safe, and has a great fil filtration system and everyone wears masks. So it's a very safe environment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Good. But, you know, Jeannie, I think what's interesting is when we were talking before, you had said this um, whole truth, these truths has taken a life of its own. You mm -hmm. birthed it and you've seen it go through its infancy, through its, oh. its, its, its 20s, its teens and beyond. <laughs> And it's almost like, I don't know what stage it's in, but yeah, tell us more about the journey that this play has been. Cause, and, and, and you created this about 15 years ago or uh, how long I ago? Started, um, I started interviewing Gordon. My first interview with him was in 1997. And um, I had one person shows on my mind because in the 1980s and the 1990s, they were just starting to come into being there were not nearly as you know um, uh, numerous as they are now. It was a new kind of art form. And I'd seen a couple of them, one by a Japanese uh, actor who I really admired, um, who's a friend, Jude Narita. And she did a show where she played five different characters. And you know, I'd never seen anything like that before. One person on stage playing all these different characters. And, um, and then I saw another one person show um, with this, you know, a similar um, uh, format. And I was really fascinated by this new form of storytelling. And then I encountered Gordon's story. And I thought this would be a great one person show where Gordon is remembering his past and going traveling through the 1940s in his memory and meeting all these different people across the country and during his journey, you know, um, and that stayed in my mind. Uh, and I, as, as luck would have it, I got a job in Seattle as an actor. And I met a young woman up there who had just interviewed Gordon for a, a high school paper or college paper, college paper she was writing. She had his contact information. And so she gave it to me. So I called him up and I said, you know, I introduced myself and I said, I'm an actor in theater and I would love to see if I could develop a piece about your World War II Supreme Court challenge. And he was very welcoming and he said, <laughs> I love this story. He said, well, he said, you know, you're from California. You said, I said, yes. And he said, are you ever in the Bay Area? Because I have two brothers living there. And I said, oh yes, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna be there such and such a date. And it turned out, you know, coordinate with um, his visit to the Bay Area. And he said, I'm gonna need a ride from my brother Jim's place to my brother Ed's place. Cause my brother Jim is in Mill Valley and my brother Ed is in Glen Ellen. And he said, how about you give me a ride? <laughs> and you can tell my story. <laughs> And I can tell you stories on the way. And then when we get to Ed's place, I'm sure Ed's wife will feed you lunch. And then you can hear us three brothers talking to each other. And so he was so great. He understood exactly what I needed, you know? Um, and uh, it was just great fun meeting him. I was really nervous, but he put me right at ease. <laughs> and so we did a, an interview there. And then I was so fascinated by everything he told me that I asked if I could visit him in Canada and do more interviews with him. So I had all these interviews and I came back to LA and I started transcribing them. And um, then I just started plunging in, trying to write this. I actually took the material to 
playwrights I knew and said, would you write this play? And everyone said, well, you should try and write it. You're the one with the passion. And I said, but I've never written a play. And they said, well, why not try? And so I just plunged in and I got a lot of help along the way. And, you know, 10 years later, we made our, we had our premiere at East West Players here in Los Angeles in 2007. That's amazing. And then yeah. to actually meet the person and uh, yeah, form a play around him, his words and his demeanor uh, is, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, and I was very helped by letters that Gordon wrote. He was a student, you know, in the 1940s at the University of Washington. These are letters from prison, letters when he was hitchhiking, and he wrote them all to his friend, a friend, Eleanor Ring. And Eleanor uh, saved all these letters and years later donated them to the University of Washington. So when I went to the University of Washington while I was doing this play, I was looking through this collection of letters and I was so enamored of these letters. They're just, and I think you can read some of them online if you go to the University of Washington special collections, you know, uh, you can see some of these letters online and they're just so enthralling because they sound like a you know college student in his 20s in the 1940s that they had they had that youth but they also are incredibly visionary because he's saying this is wrong and i'm going to stand up for the america that you know i was raised to believe exists it might not exist now but if i stand for it it might exist in the future so uh i could not i think have written this play without those letters. Wow. So yes, thank you. you, thank you, Eleanor Ring. <laughs> that, yeah, that's marvelous that she saved them and realized the uh, historical importance, really. Uh, yeah. And so now your current director and actor, would you like to talk about them a little? Or yeah, so that? Jeffrey Lowe and Joe Martagatak, these two guys are so wonderful. And they're really loved in the Bay Area. You know, they both grew up in the Bay Area. They're favorite sons, I think. <laughs> and Jeffrey uh, started out directing at uh, Theater Works. Uh, yes. he, he was cast, he's been casting director there. He was company manager there. So I first met Jeffrey when he was the company manager, which means he handles all the arrangements for actors who come out of town, and like the apartments and you know all the logistics, the cars or whatever. And so he was doing that and he was um, casting um, and he was just starting to direct on the main stage and his first uh, main stage productions was I think the Christmas show. And then um, he went on to direct um, a really critically acclaimed production of Language Archives by Julia Cho oh, that was at yeah. Theater Works. So Jomar played one of the leads in that, Jomar Tagatak. And um, they met and they did a, cu a couple other projects together. And the funny thing was, was that uh, Jeff had approached me about directing Hold These Trues at Capitol Stage in Sacramento. And so that was going to happen and then COVID hit. And of course, so many theater productions, including that one got canceled. And, um, then unexpectedly, Bill English from San Francisco Playhouse uh, called me um, some a few months ago and said, uh, I heard about Hold These Trues and I would love to do it here at the Playhouse in San Francisco. And he said, it would be the first play that we would be doing post COVID. And so we would be doing it with the reduced capacity, you know, in, in mm -hmm. our theater. Um, we'll just open up a small percentage of the seats and we'll have all the safety precautions in place. It's an experiment, um, but we want to bring live theater back to San Francisco as soon as possible and we think it's doable. And so I said, great, I'm on board. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, San Francisco, like I said, was always very special to me because uh, it was the city in which I experienced so many memorable moments and really um, moments that made such a great impression on me and made me want to be an artist. You know, I also had a cousin who had a boutique up there. Her name was San Sandra Sakata. 
we called her Sandy. Oh. And uh, she had this uh, boutique called Obico. Yes. Did you know <laughs> Sandy? Love that place. <laughs> oh, yes. Wasn't it a great place? And oh, so wonderful place. She was oh, such an oh, artist. Well. She, she was not a designer herself, but she brought in all yes. these. Um, oh, it was a artist. Yes. Yeah, all through San Francisco. And a lot of them didn't, hadn't ever designed fashion. They were sculptors and painters. And, but she asked them to design like one of a kind ensembles for Obiko for her shop. Oh, yes, and yes. Um, so she would, when Tim and I first got married, she'd have us up to San Francisco. So we'd stay with her and she'd take us around San Francisco to meet all these artists. And, you know, she helped us buy our first tonsu. And <laughs> yes. So San Francisco and all these memories. So I said yes to Bill right away. I said, oh, yes. yes. Oh. Yeah, I said, uh, let's do it. I said, you know, I understand it's uh, a bit of a, a risk. You know, we don't know how many people will come. We don't know how many people will. Um, but then he said, delightedly, he said, and we'd like Jomar Tagatak to play Gordon because we worked with Jomar. He's been in several of our productions. We love him, we adore him, he's fantastic. And I said, oh my God, Jomar was going to do it in San Francisco. So yes, yes, yes. And then, uh, they had worked with Jeffrey a little, I think he had done some play readings with them uh, that he directed. So uh, Jeffrey came on board and then we got a call from Sacramento from Capitol Stage saying, hey, I hear you guys are going up at San Francisco. So now we can bring you guys back to Sacramento. So after this run, uh, Joe Mar and Jeff will be taking the show up to Capitol Stage after all. Oh, that's oh my gosh, so it does have a life of its own, really. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, you can the see. Theater works, they've always been uh, really good at blind casting and Asians. And now I realize maybe Jeffrey had something to do with that. I don't know. But, uh, well, I think that, um, their colorblind casting started, you know, years ago. I think Kelly right. always, always had, Robert Kelly, the artistic director, um, and his partner, Ev Shiro, um, who was the a director of, of uh, art director and marketing director. And I think from the very beginning, that's what they wanted. You know, they wanted to cast in a way that was reflective of the Bay Area. And so for many years, a dear friend of mine, Francis Jew, who's now yes, right. an actor in New York, he, mm -hmm. he did many plays with theater works where he was cast as things as yes. in roles that we would normally not be cast in. Right, the blind casting. Actually, yes. we as cats uh, had a reception, a private reception one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with one yeah. of his plays. And, and Butterfly? Well, that's what it was. I think, uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, you know, Francis is just one of the, um, I think he's the one, another pride and joy of San Francisco, being a San Francisco native. Uh, so Theater Works has always been at the forefront of, you know, doing that kind of mm -hmm. multiracial casting. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been so lucky to be involved with these two great Bay Area theaters. Yeah, it, it's so interesting that I'm, with the times that we're living in right now, with the whole anti-Asian um, incidents happening, it seems like it was a, a really perfect time to bring it to San Francisco as well. That's what Bill English and his partner, Sarah, um, that's what they said, you know, now's the time to bring this. I'm sorry, Susie, Susie Damiano. They said, this, now is the time to bring this play to San Francisco. You know, San Francisco has been experiencing a lot of hate crimes and, you know, assaults against Asians, even Jomar, you know, who plays Gordon, has talked about walking through the streets of San Francisco and just having a kind of wariness and a real alertness of who is around him and who's passing him uh, that he didn't have to have before. And now he said he's very aware of who's in front of him, who's to the side, you know, and he makes sure that anyone that passes him you know, that he makes eye contact. And so to tell him, you know, I see you. Uh, and it's exhausting, you know. Mm -hmm. I know that mm -hmm. Jeffrey talked about his mom having to walk through a parking structure um, to get to her car, you know, from her job and being worried about her. And, and so Bill and Susie said, this is the time to tell Gordon's story here in San Francisco. So I'm really grateful to them uh, for that.
And with all your productions throughout the United States, have you sound, found different reactions from audiences? I mean, as far as yes. knowledge? Yes, here on the West Coast, people tend to know a lot more, of course, about what happened because when we take the play to these West Coast cities, it garners a lot of interest from people who either were in the camps or had relatives in the camps or parents in the camps, you know, or people who are studying what happened in these camps. And, um, you know, there isn't really an audience member in the West Coast cities that we play that. Uh, doesn't that doesn't have some connection to the camps, maybe even if it's not a personal one, right. uh, they want to know more or they know some and want to know more. It's interesting, back East, there's a lot of reactions like I had no idea. No idea. Right. In New York, I remember a friend of mine, Jewish actress that I, Jewish American actress I worked with, she said, you know, Jeannie, she said, I knew as, a teenager, something bad was happening, but I didn't know that they were taking babies out of orphanages who were, you know, one quarter Japanese or even less, had babies in orphanages and putting them behind more. But I had no idea anything that horrifying was happening. So, and she said, I would say a lot of people in New York felt the same way that they, they heard something bad was happening but the government did a good job of, you know, covering up just what they were doing and sanitizing it in a public way, making it sound like it was, you know, for our protection kind of thing. So I've been really grateful for the chances to take the play uh, to a lot of East Coast, you know, venues. Um, like we took the play to North Carolina. Um, we, we even took it to Tennessee as a staged reading you know, for an academic conference that was about Gordon's uh, Supreme Court challenge. Well, so I'm, I'm really happy for the chances to take the play to those places that where we would find audiences that don't know as much about what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II on the West Coast. And even because when we lived in New York and I'm much older, uh, they even had trouble understanding that we were Japanese Americans. Oh. What they did were they first connected with Japanese companies coming over. Oh, and, and so they you're right. So, you know, there's there's a second barrier there too, sometimes with knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So and I can see where a stage reading is really effective. Yes, we've um, we've in addition to having our professional productions, we've been able to do a lot of stage readings in different community events like we did for Moss and Marsha, you know, in Salinas. Yes. And we'll have um, an actor just with the music stand and the script. But uh, we also have sound cues that we can bring sometimes on a computer, which adds so much. And um, sometimes the guys know the script well enough that they can, you know, step away from the script. And it's almost like watching a performance because the play is a solo play and the play is really about the actor. I mean, we've had amazing, amazing designers who have brought in incredible design work on lights and projections and sound, you know, but at its essence, you know, this is a story about one person. And so these stage readings can be really effective and low cost. So we've been able to bring them in. Like we've done a number of JCL um, mm -hmm. gatherings, you know, conventions or um, just social gatherings. Uh, we've done some colleges. Uh, we did a staged reading at the Clinton Center in Arkansas, oh, Little Rock, wow. Arkansas. Great. Uh, yeah, for several high school groups around Little Rock. And so this is a great way to experience. Oh, we did also did one in Sacramento. We also did one in San Francisco. We've done quite a few of them. You know, we, we did one at a Quaker school <laughs> and it's just a good way to share Gordon's story with groups that don't have the, um, you know, the budget to bring in a professional production, which is quite costly, you know. I mean, this is this play, I, I, this is a play that, that every American really should really see and, or, and hear about in one way or another. Yeah, you know, just today, I, I saw there was an article in the, um, that the Air Force, is bringing a George Decay comic of his story 
and spreading it and sharing with oh. everyone in the Air Force, which is, yeah, it, it's a first step. It's it, the education of what uh, Asian and Americans have gone through. Yes. Is so important. Um, and we, um, we always want to make sure that it's, it resonates with people, that it's, a, that it's a thread. It's something that they might become appreciative of our, our history and our culture to understand what, we've, what we are and why we are um, at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that you know, our director, uh, Jeffrey Lowe, he did an interview with the date book, San Francisco Chronicle, and before the play opened, um, a reporter came to visit with Joe Mar and Jeff during rehearsal. And he was talking about how, you know, the, the theater at San Francisco Playhouse is called the Empathy Gym. And I love oh. it because their goal is to do theater and tell stories on stage that foster empathy. And what is empathy but stepping into another person's shoes and being able to understand what they're feeling you know, as if it were happening to you. And um, it was one of my goals with this play. One reason why I wanted to tell it in a one person solo show format is I wanted audience to really be able to step into Gordon's shoes, to walk in his shoes and to know what that felt like, to think of yourself as an American mm -hmm. and to, you know, you know, Gordon is navigating the schizophrenia of being a Nisei student during that time, he, you know, believes in America, he believes in the constitution, but you know, there's no way in hell that he's you know, experiencing equality because he's a Japanese American and you know, there's hostilities against Japanese Americans and you know, there's places he can't go, you know, restaurants and movie theaters, but he had that hope. You know, and he said, it, it, we just worked our way around it in order to survive. Um, but then the bombing of Pearl Harbor just changed everything overnight. And um, I, I'm hoping that people know when they see all these truths, what it's like to have that, have your world suddenly turned upside down and to suddenly be viewed with hatred and suspicion um, by the rest of the country that you call your own country. You know, I, it was one of my hopes that they would feel people watching it, that they were going and to understand what Japanese Americans went through. And a number of people have told me they did feel that way, people who aren't Asian, not Japanese American. Um, and so that's been really gratifying to me to hear that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when we saw it, it was a standing O, so of course. I, I think everybody was involved in it. Yeah. And it does, it does fit into the climate of what we were talking about earlier too. And so was he able to see the completion or where was Gordon his... never saw the play on stage because it was sad he got Alzheimer's disease while I was still working on it and so he knew that I was writing it because I would call him every now and then to say did I get this right or can you tell me a little more about this one? so he knew I was writing it and he read some of the play well uh, that's perfect yes yeah. what I sent to him uh, but he got Alzheimer's before I actually finished the play and shopped it around and got the first production. Okay. Uh, but many members of his family have seen it. His children have seen uh, the play several times and okay. they really loved it, which has been hugely rewarding for me, so gratifying. And uh, relatives of Gordon have seen it. We've had a couple of productions where we had, you know, Hirobayashi's, <laughs> uh, you know, just flood the theater. And <laughs> in Seattle, they were having a family reunion and they were um, going on a, a boating trip or something. And so they were all like, gathering in Seattle, they all came to see the play. Oh, perfect. It was so great. And then again in Vancouver, because a lot of them, you know, Gordon made his home in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And so a lot of his family's up there. So a whole bunch of Hirobayashis came to <laughs> the, the play in Vancouver. Oh, that's, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, earlier I mentioned the Watsonville Hall of Fame, but tell us more about the Jeannie Sakata um, collection in the <laughs> Library of Congress. Oh, that was so uh, special and such a surprise. My dear friend, Leah Chang, who is 
a actress slash journalist slash photographer slash blogger. You know, she's an amazing woman. And she had a friend who was working in Washington DC at the Library of Congress. And uh, her friend was starting a collection there of Asian American artists in the theater. And so that's how that came about. You know, I had just started working um, on productions of Hold These Trues. It had just premiered. Um, we were, I was gathering a lot of information. There were programs and there were interviews and things like this. And she said, you know, someday some young student is gonna wanna know about these beginnings of this play. Absolutely. And so I think you should be in touch with my friend. So um, I sent all these things to her friend at the Library of Congress and that's how that got started. And, you know, along with me, there were uh, other artists that of Asian American descent that were contacted to start collections of theirs. Uh, so yeah, it's really great to know that um, your work has been valued that way and that- Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. What a testament, what a nice tribute. And thank you for reminding me because <laughs> I just realized, wow, that was shortly after the first production. And I have so many more things to add to that now. <laughs> Absolutely, you're right. I was going through my closet and I got out the whole these trues box of programs and posters and stuff. And a, I was a lot of good reviews. Oh my <laughs> God. I said, look at all the programs. We have been to so many cities. <laughs> I was thinking of, you know, trying to find a collage artist and having them make like a wall. Oh, that would be pretty. Oh, yeah. Nice. Postcards, mm -hmm. programs. I mean, I have just a whole box full of. <laughs> I, I want to let you know, Jeannie, that there's a number of people have been weighing in and watching oh. and um, Charlene and Shirley, everyone oh, has said, that we've seen you, we've seen you, hey, um, everybody. We're, rooting, we're rooting for other actors and actresses and Asian. Um, we have yes. people who have said, we. several of my cousins and I saw Joel de La Fuente star and hold these truths at Lucy Stern and Mountain View. And Joel was amazing. We enjoyed the show tremendously and learned so much. Thank you so much. So we you have know, a lot I, of fans. I'll put in a plug for Joel too. You know, he also starred on this uh, critically acclaimed series on Amazon called Man in the High Castle. Oh, he was not that. Oh, yes. He was yeah. the Japanese chief of police, Inspector yes. Kido. And when you watch that TV show, you cannot believe that that actor played Gordon Hirabayashi, you know, <laughs> Joel, his range is just incredible. Yes. And uh, shout out to Joel. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I saw in one of your interviews, it was amazing. I think they were, they were just um, so impressed on the, ma the magnitude, on the virtuosity of any actor who has played this character because- yeah. it, and being a one man show, I mean, he mm -hmm. was slipping into other characters. You have Joel was actually the first actor, I think, that did Holy Truth that counted, actually counted up all the characters. Oh. And he said, Did you know that I'm playing 37 characters? Really? <laughs> wow. In your show. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, said, an achievement. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that many. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's great but yeah the actors that do this show I tell you um I mean amazing when I think of the actors I've gotten to work with and see play Gordon and these 37 other characters I'm just always so humbled because you know I've watched them all do it and it's so courageous of all of them to take this on you know and there have been about I think seven or eight Gordons now, more if you count the staged readings. Right. And um, I, I just love them all and I'm so grateful to all of them. That's beautiful. It's legacies that live on. Yeah. And, and I like to think that Gordon himself would be so pleased by this because, you know, we've had um, Korean American Gordon, Chinese American Gordon, <laughs> Filipino American Gordon. Japanese American Gordon. We've had Hapa Gordons. <laughs> and actually, we commented on Gordon. Gordon. We've had gay Gordons. We've had <laughs> and, and different ages, you know. Wow. Um, there was a student group called 
um, ginseng um, that are in Rochester, in New York State, I believe, um, headed up by a woman, wonderful woman, Randy Kaplan, and it's a student Asian American group. And this young um, actor who was actually a college student, you know, did the a stage reading for them. And um, he totally memorized the text. He had the script there because it was a stage reading, but he just glanced at it every now and then. I thought, wow. wow, the amazing commitment of this young college student to, to memorize this whole thing. <laughs> you know, I, I've just been so incredibly lucky with the actors that have done it. And, and I remember we commented on the Palo Alto one, how well this how well he could pronounce the Japanese names and words. Yes. I mean, um, considering that they're not all, they're not all Japanese actors. That yeah, was, you know, the, most of the productions, if the actor, uh, you know, and I'm Japanese American, but if I were doing this play, I would need help with the pronunciation. Right, I mean, it's a small thing, but I mean, it's a, a realistic thing. Yeah, because yes. I know the basics, but like, which syllable do you stress when this is the sentence? Like, you know, the, I would totally need help with that because there's, there's some long sentence that I have in the play, like uh, the Japanese translation of, I don't care if that girl is a Quaker, you get that girl a ring, you know? And I would be able to phonetically sound out the Japanese for that, but I wouldn't be able to know all the time where the stresses yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, and the subtle. So usually, you know, we have someone who is a Japanese coach that works with the actors um, to get the Japanese. That's right. Um, and sometimes it takes, you know, several tries. <laughs> because, you know, if you don't grow up hearing the language, yes. you know, it's, it's like, I remember as an Asian actor, you know, I've had to do uh, uh, lines in various, you know, Asian languages. And right. yeah, it's, it's hard when you, I had to do um, Khmer, which is a Cambodian dialect once for a TV wow. show that I did. And I, it's so hard when you haven't grown up hearing it. I'd never heard this uh, language before. And it just took me so long to wrap my head around the sounds. Of it. <laughs> so uh, what are your future plans? <laughs> well, um, I just finished another project. I had a commission to write an audio play, a radio play okay. for a, a theater company here in Los Angeles whose specialty is audio plays, LA Theater Works. Oh. And it's actually a Bay Area story, so I'll put in a plug for that. Okay. It's about the Coram Nobis battle that Fred Korematsu fought in the 1980s uh, with a legal team that was led by Dale Minami, you know, yes. uh, who's a civil rights pioneer, attorney in the Bay Area. I'm actually gonna see him <laughs> tomorrow, actually. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And, um, Don Tamaki, you know, yes. who's uh, Dale's partner in the legal firm that they have in San Francisco right now. And Lorraine K. Benai, who wrote uh, Enduring Conviction, wonderful book about Fred's Coram Nobis battle. Um, it also has Peter Irons as a character in it, you know, um, a political science professor uh, who taught for many years at UC San Diego and who discovered uh, boxes of documents along with Aiko Hertzig Yoshinaga. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Peter Absolutely. and Aiko discovered evidence at uh, the National Archives in Washington, right. D.C. that showed that um, the government was just flat out lying at the Supreme Court that there was military necessity to mass incarcerate all people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast. You know, they suppressed, altered, and destroyed evidence at Fred Gordon and Min Supreme Court trials. And so the play I wrote is, is called For Us All. And it centers, it mentions all three cases, but it centers on Fred's Coram Nobis battle on, and on how Peter and Aiko found this evidence um, of this you know, massive government cover up and the line at Fred's Min Gordon Supreme Court cases and how they took this evidence to Dale Minami and um, uh, showed him this, talked to him about this evidence and then how Dale and Lori Banai, who was working for Dale at the time, um, gathered together this legal team of Bay Area 
uh, lawyers, many of them Sanse, and who worked pro bono for years to overturn these criminal convictions because their own parents had been in these camps. So um, it, it's the story of how the legal team came together and, and won Fred's case. And so you can go to LA Theater Works. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you about that, LA Theater Works. Okay. Yes. And hopefully, if it's an, if it's a, an auditory play, yes, it, it? it's a radio play. Oh, oh, um, cool. And you can purchase it for down, downstream, oh, I'm sorry, oh, downloading yeah. uh, to, down, to stream it. And mm -hmm. there's also a, um, a program with the biogra biographies uh, of the whole cast it's a it's a big cast a lot of wonderful la actors that i know and love down here yes. and um, um also there's biographies of the attorneys i had to limit the play to um to five members of the legal team which is peter Ico, dale don and Lori. so they're characters in the play <laughs> and um i hope someday i'll be able to turn it into a stage play that does sound well. That sounds like another play that can go on and on and on. Right. Education and interest and wow. entertainment. Sounds, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm really grateful to LA Theater Works for giving me nice. the commission to work on the play because um, it was something I probably wouldn't have done without their um, asking me to. And, you know, we got a grant from the uh, California Civil Liberties Public Education Program uh, to write the play and to record it. Um, so it was just a wonderful experience because, you know, I, I got to bring together uh, so many people who I respect and admire and, and love uh, to, to make a piece that will hopefully educate more people about the Quorum Nobis battles of the 1980s. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I hate to tell you, but it's, we're at yeah. our last few minutes of our program. <laughs> this was our has flown by. Yes, it by. Has. Absolutely. Wonderful. <laughs> and something that we always like to ask our, our, our quite a, you know, a successful playwrights, actresses, and so on is like, what advice would you give to someone who was interested in getting into television into theater into I mean, writing as a, a writer or an actor or a little um, both all of the above thank you yeah. well first i would say it's never too late <laughs> i became a playwright you know years after i i was an actress and i didn't know if i could do it but i just took the next step in front of me there's always that next step in front of me or in front of any artist. And one thing I've learned is patience and to just think in terms of the next step. You know, along the way, you, you never stop growing, you never stop learning. If the first step is to take an acting class, just take that first step. If, the, if you're further along and, you know, you're wanting an actor wanting to write a play, <laughs> you know, take that first step and then that step leads to other steps. Um, one, one thing I will also say is to just start putting your work out there uh, because uh, Nia Vardalos, who, you know, of my big fat Greek wedding, I, I listened to her give a wonderful talk once. And she said, you know, my big fat Greek wedding started when I, I was, um, in this class, I think a monologue writing class, this little theater in um, Los Angeles. And they met once a week, I think, and the assignment was to just share a monologue, write a monologue from maybe your family or something like that. And so she did a monologue with one of her crazy uncles or crazy aunties. <laughs> and they really loved what she did. And they said, oh, bring us more. So she started to write more and more, and that eventually became my big yeah. fat creep. <laughs> and so that's what I tell artists who are you know, starting is just really be clear about what steps you have to take to get where you want to go. And then commit yourself to by such and such a date, I will take that first step. I will call about that acting class. You know. I will make that phone call to ask so and so about you know what they would recommend. I, I it's how I wrote Hold These Truths. Is, you know I had a goal. Someone gave me a commission to write it. So I said by such and such a date, 
I want to finish the first fourth of the play to, to this event. And I might not like what I wrote. I might think this is awful. Why did I ever think? But I will finish it no matter what shape it's in. And so you set goals for yourself like that. And that's, I think that's really good discipline because along the way, you know, more things come into your life that will inform you is this the path I should be on, or is it maybe this over here? And um, so that's what I would say, just in terms of practical ways to start an acting career or start a writing career. Um, but I will also say, uh, really seek out good mentors who can help you set those goals. And there's so many wonderful uh, teachers out there and mentors who can give you, you good advice. And, and you have to commit yourself to following through. Um, you'd be amazed at how many people uh, do not follow through on the steps that they lay out for themselves. And some of that has to do with fear. So, so lots of times I think we have to also maybe get therapy if we need it to know why the fear is holding us back, what the fear is. Uh, I think that being an artist is such a commitment in terms of the soul and the spirit, as well as you know the practical things we need to do to get an artistic career that we want. Uh, so um, I would say, you know, be courageous and brave. And even if you're feeling fear, take that first step. You might find out that it's not for you, but if it's meant to be, you know, you will know what the next step is or you will know to ask about it. Does that help? <laughs> Very much so. Oh, that's yeah. helpful. That's and then there's a whole bunch of, you know, books I can recommend, you know, things like that. When we have more time, I could... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we are, we look forward to having you back, and we look forward to having you back with Jeff, Jeff and, and Joe Mar. Yes, that would be fabulous. I'd get those guys here. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> so, folks, please, please, if um, you're interested, please. If, if, how can you not be interested after hearing this? But go <laughs> to San Francisco Playhouse and watch the play with us, uh, and and. Also, if I don't know if it's going to be online in Sacramento or is it just going to be in theater? I don't know that yet. I, I'm not sure. I'll find that out for you. But the stream will be available up until um, July 3rd. So if you want to see the stream of it, you know, purchase it now, your ticket. And it's a sliding scale, which is really lovely. I'm so happy this week there's doing that. So you can see it for as little as $15. Um, and then, you know, if you can afford more, they have, I think, four tiers. So you can pay what you can. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you for being our hero. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, my God. You guys are my heroes. Thank you for supporting oh, Asian Americans in the theater. <laughs> we need you. We need you. Oh. <laughs> It's such a positive experience. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you so much. We really oh, appreciate it. So much. All, All right. right. Thank you so much, everybody. Until next time. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.